pray for us? I, as was, we're about, I was about to ask you for that. Please. Let's pray together. Nice. Heavenly Father, we are present here. Dr. Salach is present here. But we need the most important thing, which is your presence. Because it's the one that provides healing to each one of us. Lord, we're going to be talking on a, a difficult topic, a trauma. Satan has been doing evil stuff to each one of us. But the most important thing is that we have a, the divine healer, which is Jesus Christ. So help us out, Lord. Talk to us. Heal our hearts and be with us. We ask for your presence and to be with the, with the speaker. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. Thank you. <clears throat> As I'm beginning, I'd like to um, just warn you that some of what I talk about could be triggering for some of you. And if it is, you know, let me know, and we, can, we, we don't want you to stay triggered. You know, we want you to get the help that you need. So tra trauma, how it affects our lives. So there's so much brokenness in the world around us. I mean, you know, you, just by listening on the news to the kinds of things, the kinds of catastrophes with, you know, floods with thousands of people dying and earthquakes, I mean, all of those kinds of things are traumatic for those who experience them. And even for those of us who, who look at them, even on the news, there's this thing called secondary trauma where we can be traumatized even by looking at those kinds of things, even though we didn't experience them personally. So it's important for us to understand that. According to national data from the Healthy Mind Study, student mental health concerns have escalated over the last 10 years. And, and the suicide rate for kids ages 10 to 14 nearly tripled in the last decade. And we certainly have seen an uptick in that as a result of COVID-19 and the, res the, the lingering results of that. So it's something that we need to be aware of. In 1917, suicide was the second leading cause of death for children ages 10 to 14, teenagers 15 to 19, and young adults 20 to 24. But the suicide rate among children aged 10 to 14 has nearly tripled from 2007 to 2017, while the suicide rate among older teenagers has increased by 76%. So we need to look at this. This is federal data now. These are federal studies. So what is trauma? A trauma, a traumatic or life-threatening event that is outside the normal range of, of what we normally experience every day. It's something outside of that that we're not accustomed to that is painful. So it's a deeply distressing or disturbing experience. And it arises when either adults or children experience or witness such an event. These events confront people with such horror and threat that it may temporarily or even permanently alter their capacity to cope, their perception of threat, or their self-concept. So when we talk about temporarily or permanently, permanently would be evidenced with some type of what we would now call a mental illness, you know, a traumatic mental illness. It could even result in, in mental diagnoses like schizophrenia, which is above, you know, m more severe than something like anxiety or depression. So when you go through, see, or learn about an event in, involving actual or threatened death, injury, or serious, even sexual violation, that's traumatic. So acute results, types of trauma. So acute trauma is a single event. For example, if you ever got into a car accident, is that traumatic? Yeah, it's traumatic, it would, wouldn't it be? Especially if there were someone who, who was injured or someone who died in the automobile accident. So that's an example of acute trauma. But chronic trauma is repeated or prolonged trauma. People who live a certain way that is hurtful for many, many years. 
They just have learned to live that way. Complex trauma is varied or multiple traumatic events, usually invasive or interpersonal. For example, if a child was, let's say, uh, sexually abused as a little girl or a little boy, and then later on they experienced some type of um, event that uh, was traumatic, then you have the original trauma, but then you have things layered on top of it. And all of those things create a more complex type of trauma, which needs more complex treatment. So how does trauma show up? Well, at school, kids can be daydreaming. They, they, they cannot be, maybe they're not attentive. They, they run from the classroom, maybe, if they get triggered in the classroom. They might be hyperactive give blank looks or stares, behave aggressively in the classroom, exhibit defiance against authority, against the teacher, or they might appear to be sleeping. One of the things that we know is that there's a correlation between trauma and ADD, attention deficit disorder, okay? So often those two go together when there's been trauma. And we see that in children, often in school or older, even uh, young adults. So in the community, in the community, if it's been a community trauma, for example, if, if there's been a, a major flood or let's say a hurricane or earthquake, the whole community experiences anxiety or sometimes perhaps depression. There might be an increase in divorce rates as a result of it. There might be family issues, family conflict as a result. A crisis of belief. In other words, does God really exist? Why would he let this happen to us? Those kinds of questions. Discouragement. Self-medication. How do we self-medicate? Some people self-medicate by eating. Some people use alcohol or drugs. Some people use pornography. Some people even use religion to self-medicate. So all of these are things that happen. So what is adverse childhood experiences? What is an ACE score? I'm going to talk about the adverse childhood experiences study, which is a, the, the classic study that was done in the mid-'90s by Dr. Vincent Felitti and his team. Well, here are the ACEs that they looked at. The first column are the ACEs that they examined. So were you emotionally abused? In other words, were you put down or demeaned or shamed or told you were not enough? Were you physically abused, beaten, for example, to the point where there were bruises? Were you sexually abused? Emotional neglect is when a parent might physically be present but not emotionally there for you, because they're maybe not connected to themselves. Physical neglect are when your, your basic needs for food, clothing, shelter are not met, medical care. You don't get that as a child when you should or need it. You might have a mentally ill parent. That's traumatic for a child. You might have a parent who's uh, wrapped up in their own addiction. You might have parental divorce. This is very traumatic for children. Or you might have a parent in prison. Now, these were the original ACEs. But in addition to those, I've added some others. For example, spiritual abuse. For example, if you're beaten up with the Bible or even the spirit of prophecy and told you're not measuring up, you know, those kinds of things. If you're raised in an unsafe neighborhood, if you've been bullied, if there's constant pressure for you to perform and your sense of identity is connected to performance, but not just your being, you know, if your value is not about just who you are, but what you do, that's, that's a form of trauma. If you have a domineering parent who always tells you what to do, is always controlling you and not, not uh, empowering you to make good, healthy decisions for yourself. Parental abandonment or death, you know, parents sometimes through divorce or just uh, maybe, a, maybe a single parent family 
where there is either death of a parent or divorce, that's traumatic. Or if you're raised in a war-torn country, the way so I know that some of you were, it's very, very traumatic as well. It's a form of trauma. Okay, so here's what we, this is an example now. I want you to be attentive. This is a little video, and I want you to just put yourself into this situation right now. Okay? It's coming. It's coming. How did you feel when the nice music was playing, sitting on the beach? Wasn't it just peaceful and nice? But then when that other music started, what ha what, what, how did you start feeling then? Huh? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm hmm It's like, oh no, what's happening? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, that's an example of if you just let yourself be in those situations where the trauma can overtake you, even perhaps in a peaceful setting like that, huh? Okay. <clears throat> Look at this. We all go through the same stuff, but it affects some of us differently, right? One of the things that we know, you're familiar with the concept of resilience. Resilience is the ability to bounce back from trauma. It doesn't affect you as much as it does someone else because you are more resilient. And, and about 20% of people who go through the same types of trauma as others are not negatively affected by it because of this resilience factor. So, the larger dog is not as affected as the, the, the smaller dog, okay? That's just an example of resilience. So the brainstem, there are, there are ways that we cope with trauma. The first thing is, if you were, if you were walking down a path out in the woods and you guys are going to, to a park you know, soon, aren't you, to have your your uh, worship outdoors, but if you were walking down the, a, a path and you saw a snake, what would happen to you inside? The first thing is, yo, a snake. Maybe some of you love snakes, I don't know, but, but you know, for most of us, ah, a snake, especially if it's a poisonous snake, right? And we would want to do what? We would want to get out of there. We would want to run, right? But I want to ask you, have any of you had to fight to survive? Just to survive, you've had to fight. You know, there's some people, for example, who are raised in unsafe neighborhoods, and they learn to always be on the alert, to always be hypervigilant, because their neighborhood isn't safe. They learn to survive by fighting. Some of us not only fight physically, but some of us learn to fight emotionally, because our world is not safe. 
But that's a normal response. To fight, to run. Another one is, is to freeze, to be immobilized. You know, have you ever seen in a, I think it's an opossum, right? And they're being, they're being hunted by some animal, and what do they do? They just freeze. And that animal comes and thinks they're dead and doesn't eat them. But that's, that's a freeze. And so sometimes that happens to us too when we're traumatized. We just, we just get paralyzed. We don't know what to do. We don't fight. We don't run. We just freeze. Okay? Fawning is when you try to get close to your, your perpetrator. For example, when I was in high school, I heard as a freshman that the sophomores were out to get the freshmen, to pick on them. So what did I do? I found some of those, fre some of those sophomores, and I got real close to them so they wouldn't beat me up. That's an example of fawning. And that often, also, often happens, for example, in the case of living with a, a violent spouse, for example. I want to make him feel good so he won't hit me, that kind of fawning. And then flocking is when you come together with a bunch of others as a survival mechanism. And that can be good if they're all in, the, in a process of emotional healing. So it's important to understand that we have two types of, of brain. We have a thinking brain, which is the prefrontal cortex, okay? Our thinking brain. And then we have our emotional brain. And that is usually the amygdala, the, the midbrain, is our emotional brain. The prefrontal cortex is our thinking brain. The ideal is that there's an integration between those two, the left brain and the right brain, where they're working in harmony together. Okay? They're working together. But when trauma occurs, often the thinking brain goes offline, and it's the emotional brain that controls our behavior. Okay? And controls our bodies, by the way. So, so we have a crisis that occurs, and again, the survival brain is is our reptilian brain, the spinal cord, okay? And then why? The emotional brain asks why. That's the limbic system. How is more understanding. That's the prefrontal cortex, the neocortex. And then what happened is the thinking brain. We finally end up figuring it out. But the crisis occurs, and we first go to the, the default brain is not the thinking brain, but it is the the emotional brain. That's where we go first. So you can see here trauma's impact on the brain, OK? A healthy brain is the brain on the left, OK, where there's a lot of you know, positive firing there. But you see the deficits there in an abused brain. They did, they did actual pictures of these brains. So we have the red are the most active areas and the black are the least active areas. And you can see an abused brain is, is a poorly developed brain. It's not functioning as it should. So trauma's impact on the brain here, you can see this is, these are three-year-old children, a normal brain. But you see how small that brain is of that three-year-old? And you see the deficits that are open there? And so extreme neglect can result in underdevelopment of a child's brain. OK, so if you, look at, if you look at this example, if you put your hands out like this, OK? This is, this is the, the, the fingers are the neocortex, the prefrontal cortex, the upper brain, your logic center, your thinking brain, right? OK? And the brain stem is this part, OK, down here. The limbic regions are represented by your thumb, OK? And so, and so your brain working in harmony is when the lid is not flipped. In other words, your thinking brain is not offline. But when your thinking brain is covering 
your limbic system, okay? That's just a, an example that you can use to illustrate healthy functioning of a brain. Okay, now epigenetics. This is, this is important. Epigenetics is a study of how our, our um, inherited changes and, and how they predispose us to developing certain functions. For example, asthma is one, is one thing. There are environmental causes, there are genetic causes, and then there are epigenetics. And epigenetics are, are things that, they're, they're genes that get turned on or get turned off based upon things that happen to us, how we're exposed to, to various things like trauma. Trauma can turn genes on and result in things that otherwise wouldn't affect us. Going back to Dr. Felitti's study, for example, what, it, what, he what he showed is that in his first 10 ACEs, two-thirds of the population have at least one, okay? And when you have one as opposed to none, his research showed that there's a higher probability of physical illness, chronic physical illness, later in life because of epigenetics, chronic phys physical illness. If you have two, it's even more. If you have three, it's even more. But when you get to four, the probability does not go up linearly of physical illness, chronic later, mental illness like depression, anxiety, or self-destructive things like our addictions. You know, all of those go up linearly, but when you get to four, they go up exponentially, the probabilities of those things. What percentage of our population do you think has four or more aces? A guess. Huh? 75%? Nope, two thirds have one. Twelve and a half percent have four or more. Twelve and a half percent. Okay, higher probabilities of these things. So this is important for us to understand that genes get turned on or off. So healthy relationships, a stable home environment, help our children feel safe and ready to learn. I want you to remember four aces, okay? The first one, not four aces, four S's, four S's. The first one is that you're seen. You're seen. I, a parent sees their child or their grandbaby. They see them. I see you. You know, I'm, you know, I'm involved in your life. I know you. You're, you know, I love you. I see you. Okay? After being seen, when, when a person is seen, there is a soothing, the second S, a soothing or a comfort that comes with being seen and being known. The next ace, I mean the next S, is feeling safe. Children need to feel safe in their home. And then finally, they feel secure. Secure, okay? And you might have heard of secure attachment, right? When children are securely attached to their parents, they have a, an ability to be able to rest there, okay? And there's been research done by some of my students, some of my doctoral students, that draws a correlation between whether we are securely attached to our parents or not and whether we can securely attach to God or not. Does that make sense? Because when we, when we say our Father who art in heaven, we're praying to a father figure, right? But when a person's father figure is not a stable father figure, not one that you can securely attach to, but rather you have anxious attachment or 
avoidant attachment because you don't want to get too close to him because he's not safe. Or if he's abusive, we call it disorganized attachment. Okay? So any of these other forms of attachment than secure attachment leaves room for doubt in that person about whether God is really safe too. And I'd like to suggest to you that many of us are even now, even, even though we're in this room and we profess knowing God and profess that he loves us, that we're still on a journey of learning to trust him fully. Does that make sense? We're learning to trust him fully. And is there anything wrong with learning to trust him fully? No. You see, if the reality is that we're all broken, it means we're all on a journey of healing too, right? Or we can be. That's what God wants us to be, on a journey of healing. So adverse childhood experiences can result in seeing the world through different lenses. Different lenses. So the Bible talks about being renewed by the transforming of your mind. Okay, Romans 12, 2. So our minds need to be renewed. And when I'm talking about our minds being renewed, I'm talking about an actual healing for many people of the brain. A healing of the brain. Particularly of that midbrain. So now, the sanctuary model of care is very, very interesting. I'm going to talk about some healing strategies now. So the sanctuary model of care, you remember the sanctuary service, right? The outer court, the holy place, the most holy place in the sanctuary. Well, this lady by the name of Sandra Bloom has developed a sanctuary model of healing. And so this sanctuary model moves away from asking questions like, what's wrong with you? Or, you know, why are you doing that? You know, do you hear the judgment in those kind of questions? What's wrong with you? Or why'd you do that? To asking this question, what happened to you? Do you hear the gentleness of that question? What happened to you? What kind of trauma did you experience? What was your life like? What was your story like? Or what's right with you? Because we need to take a look at not only what happened to people that damaged them, but also that, you know, the strengths that they have, the resilience that they have, the things that they are going through with courage. All of those things are important to acknowledge, not just the bad stuff. Does, does that make sense to focus on, on, on the growth not just on the deficit. So, <clears throat> a brain break. I want you to do something. At least you don't have to. You, you're, you, can, you can choose not to. But I'd like to suggest this. Those of you who are comfortable doing it. I'd like you to get a partner and what I'd like you to do with your partner is I would like you to look at them in their eyes. To look at their face and just look at their eyes for a moment. So those of you who, can, who are willing to do that, if you would turn toward the person who is your partner and just look at them in their eyes gently for a period of time and I'll tell you when to stop. Try not to say anything, try to just look and experience the other person. All 
Okay. <clears throat> I want to ask you now, how was that for you? How was it? Hmm? Was that easy for you to do? Talk to me. What, what was it like? Tell me how you felt doing it. I'm sorry. You're a people watcher. That's how you learn about people? Yeah. Okay. So how was it watching this dude? I don't, I just know who he is. You know who he is? <laughs> okay, okay. The longer it was, it was uncomfortable, more uncomfortable? Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. And other people, what was it like for you? Go ahead. Uncomfortable after a while. Why do you think it was uncomfortable for, for some of you after a while? Oh, yours was your little one? Oh, okay, okay, I get it, I get it. So, one of the reasons I wanted you to do this is there's a thing that they have discovered in our eyes called mirror neurons. Mirror neurons. And when we look into someone's eyes and you see love, you see kindness, okay, what happens is you tend to then mirror that back to them, okay? It's a positive, you know, to, to know that you're loved, to hear that you're loved, I mean, what does that do to inside of you? I mean, it's a wonderful experience to feel and to know that someone sees you. Like, th like this sister over here, she sees everybody, right? <laughs> you just watch. Oh, good. So, thank you. And so these mirror neurons get turned on the more they're used by actually seeing someone else, by looking in someone's face. So that's a nice brain break for you to use that really helps to stimulate the healing of the brain. So trauma-informed care. Trauma-informed care. See, one of the things that I am very passionate about is creating trauma-informed churches. So let's talk about what that looks like. Number one, creating a safe environment. So I want to ask you, is this dear church family a safe place for you? Is it a safe place for you to be you? Now, but, but you see, here's what a lot of us do. We come to church and, you know, someone greets you and what do you say in, res in response? I'm fine, happy Sabbath, right? We do the, that's kind of our default, right? Happy Sabbath. But what if you, you know, and this is a part of my, my precious wife's story. You know, when she was younger, she had gone through a lot of trauma and she became an Adventist at the age of 14. And she would go to church terribly depressed because of her unresolved trauma. And people would come up and greet her. Hey, Beverly, how you doing? Happy Sabbath. And she was, she was thinking of killing herself, but what did she say? Happy Sabbath. Okay? See, we need to build into our churches safe spaces where people can say, I'm depressed, or I overate last night because of whatever, 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 or I'm struggling. How many Christian men struggle with pornography? Any of you guys know? Huh? A lot. The statistics are between 60 and 70% of Christian men struggle with pornography. And for women, it used to be a third, 30%. But now it's gone up to between 40 and 50% of women struggle with pornography. Okay? Why do we do that? I'm, I'm not saying that to condemn anybody, but we medicate our pain often with that. Okay? 
So we, we, we want to create a safe environment for people to come and be healed. So have you ever thought about, or maybe you already have this, but do you have like a women's group where you meet regularly and really talk about real stuff and engage in a healing journey with the other women? Or a men's group that does the same? I'm not hearing a lot of amens. Okay. Let me ask you this. Do you have a Christ-centered 12-step group here? Do you know that our church, through our, our, our health ministries department at the North American Division, has a Christ-centered 12-step group called Journey to Wholeness? Hmm? Yeah, CR, that's not Adventist, but it's a great program. Absolutely. It's a great program, but Adventist Recovery Ministries has a lot of resources. We train people to be facilitators of these support groups. So these are safe groups that are anonymous. You know, whatever says in the group stays in the group, that kind of thing. But, but for, see, trauma-informed churches start with trauma-informed people and a commitment of the body of Christ in a place that this is going to be a safe environment for us. But you know, some, you've, you've heard telephone, telegraph, tell an Adventist. You know what happens? You know, you know what I'm talking about? You know, it's, for, many, for many of us, it's not safe because I'm afraid that if I tell sister so-and-so, she's gonna tell somebody else who's gonna tell somebody else. And then it's going to come a lot of what? Judgment. Judgment. One of the things that I've had to face on my own journey is my judgmentalism. And I had to really face that and say, wait a minute. And, and I have to admit, I learned to be judgmental as a child. So it was built into my DNA. And I had to learn to not be judgmental. It's like, no. no there is no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, right? So creating a safe environment, supporting and teaching emotional regulation. So when people are triggered and get emotionally dysregulated with some of the symptoms like we saw earlier, teaching people how to begin regulating their emotions. For example, if a person's triggered, one of the, the first things that they can learn to do is wait a minute, let's take a deep breath. Let's just take a deep breath. You know, breathe in, breathe out, breathe in, and breathe out, and let the exhales be long exhales. What does that do to the body? It relaxes the body, doesn't it? It relaxes the body. We need to be teaching those kinds of things because people are going to be triggered. And when they are, we need to teach them how to, to regulate their emotions so that they're not, they're not uh, spilling those emotions out on other people. Building relationships and connectedness is another part of trauma-informed care. Because, listen, you can't heal alone as much as you want to. You need another brain to come alongside your brain. And if your parents' brains were not safe, you need to find safe people that you can connect with, a good friend, someone that you can be open with, be vulnerable with. And that's why I'm advocating for building connections right here in our church. Now, I, I want to ask you this. If you guys and gals commit to having this lovely church be a safe place and work on creating safe environments, teaching emotional regulation and, and teaching trauma recovery and building relationships and connections. If you will engage in trauma-informed care and this becomes a safe congregation, what do you think is going to happen? to the neighborhood around you. Hmm? 
they will, they will experience the safety that's here. And will they want to run from it then? They'll want to come. Because this is a healing place. This is a healing place. And so, you know, I, I just am throwing that vision out for you because it's, it's possible. I've seen it happen. But there has to be a, a corporate commitment to it. Okay? A corporate commitment to it. Far too often in church families, you know, there's this, this group here and there's this group here and they don't talk to one another and they don't like each other. And so, you know, there's that kind of disconnection there. But, but you know, love is a command. That's a universal command that creates connectedness. And I'm going to talk more about that later this afternoon. So I want to talk about some resiliency factors for a moment. So one of the things that research has shown is that religion, and by religion I mean having a faith like Seventh-day Adventism, but having a faith and being part of a church community is, did I just get disconnected here? OK. Am I OK? Am I on? Okay. That's good. I'm getting your wallet, too. Oh, you're getting my wallet, too? Good. <laughs> okay. Is this one turned on now? OK, good. So people who attend, yeah, there we go. Now we're cooking with gas here. All right. People who tend to have a faith journey that's very personal and real for them, it's not just formalities, but it's, very, it's a part of their life, it's a part of them. They have less trauma. They have less trauma because religion is a protective factor against trauma. That's research. Now, now we also know that religion can also be uh, a traumatic of, of, uh, you know, through spiritual abuse as well. It's how we function with our faith. But religion can be protective. Okay. Here's a story for you. This ape was in a cage, as you can see, right? What they did is they took this animal and they shocked him using electrical shocks. Okay? And when an animal is shocked, is that traumatic for them? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Woo! I want to get out of this cage. But because he was locked in the cage, he could not get out. Okay? Now what they did next is this. They put another monkey in the cage with him. And then they shocked him again. And the result of that was that he did not have the severe emotional response that he did when he was alone. The power of community. The power of community. Another story is they put a dog in a cage like this, shocked the dog, and that dog was, ah, you know. But then what they did is they put three other dogs in the cage with him, but they left the door open, okay? Then they shocked all of the dogs. The other three did what? They ran out of the cage. But the dog who was shocked originally did not leave the cage. He was immobilized by that. And how much, of, how much of that is true of some of us too? Okay. So, relationships matter. The currency for systemic change was trust, and trust comes through forming healthy working relationships. People not programs change 
people. Mm. Sometimes in church we get really, really busy with programs, but it's people, connecting with people. That's what changes other people. Okay? Being able to feel safe with other people is probably the most single important aspect of mental health. Safe connections are fundamental to meaningful and satisfying lives. And this is from a book by Bessel van der Kolk called The Body Keeps the Score. If you've not read anything about this yet, this would be a great book for you to read to get to understanding about how our body holds on to. See, see where, when you're stressed out, where, do, where does your body hold the stress? For some people, they get headaches. For some people, it's in their shoulders. For some people, it's in their back. For some people, it's in their heart, in their chest. For some people, it's in their throat. For some people, it's in their digestive system. For some people, it's in their legs. You know, and, and people, have you ever had a massage? Isn't that relaxing and wonderful? But, but massage therapists report this, that when they massage the area where a person is holding stress, sometimes that person begins releasing that stress through tears. You know, the pain that they've been holding in is being released, and they're, they begin crying. But the body keeps the score. Where do you keep it in your body? As we begin our journey of healing, we release a lot of that stress that's been stored up in our bodies. And we get healthier. We get healthier. So, that's the end of our presentation for this morning. Any questions? Any, we have a couple minutes left. Any questions? Or are we done? Three minutes. Yeah. Any questions that anyone has? Okay, so during the worship service today, I'm going to be talking about some biblical healing strategies for this. Okay, because the Word of God is full of beautiful healing strategies. But do you know that the Word of God is also full of people who've experienced trauma? Yeah. Okay, and so what we're talking about is not something strange. So we're going to talk about biblical healing. And then this afternoon, you know, we've, we've learned that relationships are so important to mental health and to healing. So we're going to be talking about the kinds of things that build healthy relationships this afternoon. So thank you so much for your attentiveness. And I'm going to turn the mic over now.